Okay, hello everybody. How are you doing? Good? Perfect. Are you ready for some love or core stuff? Yeah, a little bit louder? Yeah. Yes, good. I like that. So, my name is Christoph Rumpel. So, he was quite close, but you can also say Rumpel, it's a little bit more funny. I'm a web developer from a city called Vienna in Austria. You maybe have been there as well. And you can tweet about this talk with my Twitter handle, which is just Christoph Rumpel, my name in one word together, very easy to remember. You can also stay in contact with me like that. You can also do some pictures if you want. I always appreciate that. So yeah, please use it. And yeah, let's start this talk. So it's called the Level Core Demystify the Beast. And yeah, we're all here because Level is an amazing framework, an amazing product. It brings us all together here, so I think that's already quite, um, quite something good. But um, yeah, when we talk about the core, it can be a little bit complicated. We hear things like it's magic. And magic is good when we are kids because then we like magic, but when we grow older, magic is not so fun anymore because maybe we are afraid of it and actually we want to demystify it. And that's why I'm here today. So I'm going to take you on a little journey where we talk about three parts of Lelva. So there is the request lifecycle, we're talking about facades and about eloquent. And of course, I don't have time to tell you everything about these parts because they are quite big, but I hope I could give you a little introduction into all of these today. Okay, so before that, we need to talk about why you should care about um, something like the core of Lelva. And there are some common excuses like, what do you have? It's a tool. So like my presenter here today, it's a tool that I'm using. I'm capable of using it. I'll, at least it seems like that. But do I need to know how it works? Um, I don't know how it works. I think it has something to do with infrared. I don't know. I don't care. I just want to use it. Then, of course, it takes a lot of time digging into things like probably this, but also the core of Lelva, and it can be overwhelming. Lelva is quite a big application, it's quite complex, and yeah, it's not so easy. But I think still there are some reasons why you should care. So first, it speaks to you. Of course, this presenter doesn't speak to you, at least not to me, but the core of Lelva speaks to me when I take a look at the classes. How can I use these classes? What are the properties? What are the arguments? What are the methods? It's like documentation, but in real. So I really like digging into the core to check out how I can use stuff. Then the more you know about the core, the better you'll become at debugging. Because with Lelva and other frameworks, of course, sometimes you get error messages. They are saying there was an error here, but you're working here, and how are these things connected? And yeah, Lelva is quite complex, and the more you know about the core, the better you'll become at connecting these dots and yeah, it will help you. Then, of course, Laravel is an open source framework, and it has almost 2,000 contributors. So a lot of people put their heads together to solve a lot of complex problems. And by looking at the code, we're actually looking yeah, at their solutions, so we can only learn from them. In the end, I truly believe by knowing more about the core, you will become a better developer. All right, so let's start. We have um, the request lifecycle. So what is that? The request lifecycle starts with the browser sending an HTTP request to your application. Then we need to boot up the framework. We need to handle the request, so all your business logic is happening here. And then we send it back to the browser. And this is what we talk about when we say the request lifecycle. And it all starts in this index.php file, which you will find in your public folder. And yeah, let's take a look at that because it's not too long and it quite good shows what's happening here. Okay, so the funny thing here now, this first line here, we're defining a constant called Laravel start with the current timestamp, and it's never been used in the entire framework again. <laughs> so you could delete it, and everything should work. I would still keep it there, but um, it's not my fault if you delete it, but um, it should still work because it's not used. But of course, packages like Laravel Telescope or Laravel Debug Bar are using this constant to make assumption about the performance of your application. So maybe let's keep it there, but yeah, I find it funny that that's the first thing that's happening here. Okay, now it gets more interesting. We are requiring the um, autoload file from Composer. 
So from this point, um, we are capable of spinning up new instances, because before that, um, PHP and Laravel don't know where to find these PHP classes. So this is why we're making use of this composer functionality. OK, good. Let's move on. Now it gets more interesting. We're going to turn on the lights. So that's what Taylor said here in this comment. And what we're doing here is we're getting application instance by requiring this bootstrap app file. And there are some, um, a bunch of important things happening in the back. So what do we have? We get an application instance back. OK, we already know that. But we are also going um, to get the dependency injection container. And in level, the application instance is also the dependency injection container. So um, every time you use the container, you're also making use of the app helper or the application instance. Then we need to bind, um, sorry, it was too fast. Here we go. We also need to bind the main kernels. So we have the HTTP kernel and the console kernel level. Today we are mostly talking about the HTTP kernel. Then we're also going to register the main base providers. So we have one for the logging system, one for the event system, and one for the routing system. And these are three features of Laravel that we need quite early, and this is why we load them here. OK, what else do we got? And yeah, we set some base paths so that Laravel knows where it lives inside your machine. OK, we're good to go. Let's move on. Now we're going to run the application. We are getting an instance of the kernel from the service container. This is now the HTTP kernel. And what we can do now is we can run this handle method. And every kernel in Laravel has this one public method, and it's this um, handle method. And here we're putting in some content, and we're getting back a response. And what we put in here is this request instance. And this instance has all the information about the incoming request, like the endpoint, the HTTP verb, the global variables, everything that we need. And we put it in into this kernel method, and then we get back a response. And this response has already all information that we need to send it back to the browser. So that's the next thing that's happening here is, so maybe we have some HTML we need to send back to the browser, maybe some JSON data, maybe we need to set some HTTP headers, and that's all done here by the send method. And now um, the request li lifecycle is almost finished. There's just this terminate method here, because some tasks need to run after the request has been sent back to the browser. So for example, you can define middleware that run here afterwards. And one example would be the session where some session information is stored here. And that's already the request lifecycle. We get this incoming request, we're booting up the framework, we're handling it through the kernel, and then we send it back to the browser. Of course, behind this handle method, a lot of things are happening, like all the code that you write is happening behind this method. And as mentioned, I don't have time to show you everything, but I got two examples that I want to show you, one from the kernel and one from the router. All right, so this is a method called send request uh, through the router, and it's inside the HTTP kernel. And here we are preparing the request before we send it further on to the router. And the first thing that we're doing here is binding this new request to the container. So the next time someone needs this request, it gets a fresh instance of it. Then we also need to clear out already resolved facades for the request facade. So we're going to talk about facades in just a minute, but good to know here already is the first time we use a facade, like the request facade, the instance gets stored, so the next time we don't need to get it from the container again. So this is why we need to clear it out, so again, that we get a new fresh instance of the request facade when we use it. Then also inside the kernel, we have some kind of bootstrapping to do some stuff. So what's happening here is we are loading the environment files, we are loading the configuration files, we are loading the rest of the service providers, so all the others from the framework, but also the ones that you have created or the ones from packages, they all are running here with the register and the boot method. And this way we're putting in more features to the framework that we then can use in our business logic a little bit later. OK, and here at the end, we have a so-called pipeline pattern. Bobby would be proud, another pattern here. So um, where is it? Yeah. So um, have you already used the pipeline pattern, or do you know about it? OK, just a few. Good that I'm here today so that you can a little bit learn about this pattern. It's a really cool pattern you see um, several times in the framework. So you have like some kind of content, and you send it through so-called pipes. 
and every pipe has the possibility to change the content in some way, and then you get a modified content back. And the best example is already the one here, because we're sending the request instance through Laravel's global middlewares. They are finding the HTTP kernel class, and they are responsible for checking the maintenance mode, um, trusted proxy, or validate the post size. And at the end, we get a new request instance, or it's the same, but it's modified, and now we send it further on to the router class. And this is also um, where I got a second example from the router class, and here I've got two things that show you what's, yeah, what, what are the most important things happening in the router. So first, we're going to find the route, and we can do that with the request instance, because as mentioned, in this object, we have all the information about the endpoint, um, the HTTP verb, and this helps us to find a matching route. And in Laravel, only one route is being matched, and this is what we get here. And when we get the route, we also need to run it. And in Laravel, you can bind the route to a controller method, but you can also use a callable connected to um, a route. It doesn't matter what it is, the code inside is now being run. So for example, you're going to return a few object or maybe some JSON data. And Laravel is smart enough in the back to know when it gets this um, information to create a response object of it with all the information then for the browser and then sends it back. OK, so this is already it for the um, request lifecycle. Just remember, index.php file is the main entry point for every HTTP request hitting your application. Check it out. It's quite interesting and very small. Good to read. Then we have the HTTP kernel, and also the router is very important. OK, let's talk about facades. Funny topic to talk about. There are a lot of opinions about facades. People love them. People hate them. I'm not sure if there's anything in between, but yeah, it's always, it's always risky to talk about facades, and I think that's why I like it so much. So when we talk about facades, you hear something like they are kind of magic. Ooh, they are proxies. They are helpers. They use some kind of static interfaces, whatever that means, and they are somehow connected to the service container. OK, fair enough. But you also hear something like they are misleading, hard to test, tightly coupled to the framework, and my favorite one, bad practice. And first, I'm going um, to explore with you together how facades are working, and then we come back to these statements, and I will give you my humble opinion um, about that. So the example that we have today is a route for the conference endpoint, and we're using the request facade to get, a, um, get the year parameter from the URL. So maybe the route is conference year 2019, and we want to get this 2019 through the request facade. OK, so how can we do that? By looking at the code, we see we're using this request facade class and the static get method call. OK, so the first place to look would be the request facade class. And here you see it, it's pretty empty. We only have this get facade accessor method where we return some kind of string, but there is no static get method. So where does it come from? So what we see here is we're extending a base facade. So maybe it's in there. So yeah, let's try to find out. But actually, it's not in there. But what's in there in this base facade is this magic PHP method called static. And it's responsible for static method calls where this method does not exist. And if this method is defined in this class, now this is being triggered. And here's something interesting is happening. We're getting a new instance from a facade root. And this is um, um, important to understand, because every time we use a facade, we're actually using an underlying different class, or you can also call it the service class. And we're getting this from the facade root by this get facade accessor method. So this is telling Laravel when someone wants the request facade, actually we're calling um, the service container, and with the key request, we get a different class back that we can use them. OK, so now we got a different instance. We are first checking if this instance is given. And then we also run now the same method. So we're still talking about this get method, but now on a different class. And this different class for the request facade in this case um, is this here. And now you will find that it's a request class inside the Illuminate HTTP namespace. And here we have this get method that we are now actually calling. And now we're getting the URL parameter, and we send it back. OK, cool. So this is how facades are working. 
we're using this static interfaces, this static methods here. And in the back, we're using a facade root to get the actually class that we want to use. We create a new instance of it and then call the method that we want to use. Basically, it's very similar to just asking the service container, which we can do with the helper method for this class. But it's not basically the same because there are some advantages when you use facades and there are also some disadvantages. OK, let's go back to these statements. Are facade misleading? I would say yes, at least they could be. Especially at the beginning, it's difficult to understand how they are working, what are the classes that it's being used, how is this connected. That's not so easy, so I think they are misleading, or could be. Are they hard to test? I don't have enough time to show you, but they are not. They provide some nice helper methods that you can use to easily swap out the implementation, and sometimes they even make testing um, a little bit easier with providing some cool helper methods, example, for the notification system. So I wouldn't say they are hard to test. Are they tightly coupled to the framework? Yes, of course, you can only use them inside the framework. And yeah, are they bad practice? That's a funny one, because first we need to talk about what is bad practice. I think we are good to go when we say um, not sanitizing any data from the user we put in. Maybe that's bad practice, we shouldn't do that. But using facade is not something that I would say is bad practice. It comes with some decisions about your architecture, so the, there are some advantages. If you want to um, do some more complex architecture, if you want to use more dependency injection, then maybe facades are not what you want to use. But there are also some advantages. It's very easy to use. Um, it's good to read. Um, Taylor likes using facades. I think that's, that's one thing why I think I could use it as well. And I like using them. So I would say they are not bad practice, but of course there are advantages and disadvantages. And you're all smart people. Put your heads together with your team and your colleagues and yeah, make it up to yourself if you want to use them or not. I like them. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, what else do we have? Eloquent. So what is Eloquent? Eloquent is the ORM of Laravel, which stands for Object Relational Mapper, and it uses the active record pattern. Basically, this, this just means we like to use with objects in our application, and we have a model for every database table, and we can save, update, or delete the model. So that's basically what that means, and we're using some kind of builders to make us help do these things. For example, today we have three tables. We have a speakers table, we have a conference table, and we have an intermediate table called conference speaker. So this means we have a many-to-many -many relationship between speakers and conferences. And we're extending the example from before. So now that we got the year from the URL, we want to get a specific conference, only the first one, and then get the speakers. OK, so that's pretty simple, eloquent code. You probably have already done something similar. But now we want to explore again how it's working. And we're going to start here again with the first method call. And it's a static where method on the conference model. OK, fair enough. Let's take a look at the conference model. It's pretty basic again. We only have our relationship defined, but there is no static where method defined. OK, good. But we're seeing, again, we're extending a base model. So maybe the static where method is inside the base model. Do you think it's in there? Raise your hands. OK, just a few. Uh, sorry, it's not in there. But again, we're making use of this magic PHP method. So this is also defined inside the base model class. And this is why it's being triggered, because the static where method is not defined. OK, now we're saying, OK, we'll try this again. But now we're creating a new instance. And we're running the same method, the where method, on this instance again. But this time, it's not a static method. OK, so maybe this non-static where method is being defined inside the conference model or the base model. But we've already seen it's not inside the conference model. And yeah, it's also not inside the base model. This is why we make use of another magic PHP method called underscore underscore call. So this is responsible for calls to a method where the method does not exist, but this time it's not a static method. And first we're checking if it's about incrementing or decrementing, which is not the case here. And then we're going to forward this call to another instance. So this is also a nice pattern that you see in Laravel quite often in the core, where we move um, this call forward to another instance. 
And this different instance now is what we get here from this new query method. And here we get back our first builder, and that's the eloquent builder. So now we're running this where method on the eloquent builder, and of course we also have our parameters. And inside the eloquent builder, we now find this where method. So finally we found it, it's in there, and now we can make our condition. So in this case, we're adding a constraint which looks like give us the conferences where the year is 2019. It's being stored inside the eloquent builder, and we're returning the same object again, the eloquent builder. And we do this because now we can chain other methods. So maybe we have another where method, or in our case, what we have is another first method. Okay, so what's happening with this first method? And yeah, it's also being found inside the eloquent builder through a trade which is called builds queries, and this method translates to three other methods. So the first one is the take method. I'm pretty sure you have used it before. We want to limit our query to get only one result back. Then we have this get method, and this is now responsible for executing the query. And this always gives us back a new collection instance. And this is why we need to run now another first method, but this time it's not the same method like before, not the same method that we have defined here. It's now a different method from the collection class. Because we, of course, we don't want to get the collection back, just one instance. Okay, cool, so now we got our conference back here. We've used the first method, so we have a conference instance, and now we want to get the speakers. Okay, again, pretty basic level code. It's a relationship, it just works. But again, we want to know more, we want to dive into that and check out how this is working. Because it, yeah, it's, it's quite cool how this is working. So it looks like we're calling a property called speakers on the conference model. And as you've seen in our conference model, we have no properties defined. Again, the only thing we have is we're extending the base model. So maybe the speakers property is inside the base model, but yeah, when you think about it, it wouldn't make sense at all because Laravel has no idea about the relationships that we do. But in there, in this base model, there is another magic PHP method. And I think we now got almost all magic PHP method inside Laravel's core. And this is now called underscore underscore get. And it's responsible for property calls where the property does not exist. Okay, and Laravel now thinks, okay, I think it's about um, attributes. So let's try to get this attribute for the key. And the key in our case is the speakers, because we want to get the speakers. Okay, so when we check out this method here, we're first checking if the key exists, and then we are trying to get these um, speakers from the attributes. And what you need to know in Laravel, with every model you have, you have an array of attributes where all the fields of the database table are inside. So for the conference model in this case, there would be the ID, the name, and the year. But speakers is not in there because speakers is not a field of the conference table. It's a relationship. And now Laravel is smart enough to check first if the method exists, then we want to stop that. But here at the end, Laravel thinks, okay, we're trying to get a property. It's not an attribute. Maybe, maybe it's a relationship. And now with this method, level checks if the relationship is defined, we have it defined, and this is how we get back the speakers here. And when you look at the code, it's, it's super simple, but what's happening in the bag is pretty amazing. We're making use of the model, we're making use of the eloquent builder, we're making use of the collection, and then we're making use of the relationship. And all this in one line of code, and this makes eloquence super powerful. And I find it super interesting looking at how this is implemented because, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And Eloquent is one of my favorite features of Lerva. <laughs> thanks, thanks. I didn't create Eloquent. I wish I did. <laughs> Maybe Jonathan Renning did it. I'm not sure. <laughs> there are some rumors. <laughs> okay, um, so what do we have here? So we talked about the request lifecycle, we talked about facades, and we talked about Eloquent. And I hope I could give you a good introduction into all of these topics. Of course, there's so much more to learn by diving into them in detail, and you really should do that. And I think this is super interesting because, yeah, we should all master our tools, especially the tools that we use every day. 
and I'm pretty sure that most of you use Laravel every day. It's a tool and it's important to master them because at first it will make you a better developer and you will feel much more comfortable while using it. And yeah, if you want to move on this journey, learn more about the core, of course, become a better developer, then I recommend my video course, Level Core Adventures. Who of you have already watched at least one video? Okay, a few here. Do you see in the back? Not too much in the back. Yeah, we need to change that. When you go home today, or maybe tomorrow after the party, um, please check it out. Um, I have the videos about Laravel's core. We dive into these topics like today, but in more detail and a lot of video of, on different topics. And today I have also something new for you called Laravel Core Adventures Pro. Yeah! So this is now a new paid version for Laravel Core Adventure. It turned out that I can't make a living from providing everything for free. I have no idea that nobody told me before, yeah? <laughs> so I think we made a good de deal here that, yeah, about half a little bit less of the videos are still free. For the rest, you need to pay me a little bit, and I give you more content on the way. So I think that's a good deal. Please check it out. If you like what I've done or if you like the talk, please go to levelcoreadventures.com, check out the free videos, check out the pro, and also with this, um, um, with this new version, I also record some new videos about the service container. It's about one hour of content, I think about six or seven videos where I teach everything about why you want to use the container, when you want to use the container, how you can use the container, and of course, we're checking out how it works in the back. And for me, I really think it's one of the best explanation uh, explanations of the service container because I struggled with the topic myself a lot and I think um, it's quite good. So please check it out. I also have some fancy stickers here. So please come to me or they're also lying around. I got enough for everybody. And yeah, let's all keep exploring. Thank you very much.